Hey everybody, welcome to episode 20 of Motivation With Me. So we are in the We Matter series and this is part four of the We Matter series. And as I stated in my previous video, my first one, I wanted to bring my uncle on who is, you know, a lot of you have heard me talk about my dad and domestic violence. So this is his brother. Chief Deputy Jimmy Evans. Am I saying it right? Is Chief Deputy now? Yes, ma'am. That's it. All right. Got to make sure I got it right. So I'm going to act decent today, y'all, because I got my uncle on the phone. So I can't, I can't cut up today. And as you can see, we are twins. Uh, <laughs> that's where I get it from. That's where this shiny forehead coming from. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> I know, right? We got the forehead going. <laughs> that's the Evans trademark. That's the Evans trademark. It's an Evans trademark. Um, so this is my dad's brother, and I wanted to get his intake um, as a police officer on, as you know, we're in the We Matter series, and we've been talking about police brutality, we've been talking about mass incarceration, we've been talking about white privilege. So I wanted to bring him on to get a police officer's perspective on the things that are going on in our community. A lot of people, you know, as you've heard, we have been not only dealing with the Derek Chauvin trial, but, you know, De 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 Deontay White, right, sorry, messed that up. But, um, you know, it's a hard time for us as African Americans, and we are dealing with a lot of of so much as African Americans and you know we we really need to come together and I wanted to get a police officer's perspective on this specifically an African American police officer you know I always I've been saying I kind of see it from both sides and as I've stated in my videos all officers are not bad officers and I have to stand up on both sides because my uncle is a police officer and I'm very protective of him so I have to make sure that we know that we do have police officers that are on our side. So, Mr. I'm not going to even say Mr. It's so hard not to say Uncle Jimmy. <laughs> so, Uncle Jimmy, because they already know. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your career background and, you know, your life as a police officer and just give us a summary of who you are? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Chief Deputy uh, Jimmy Evans, Fort Bend County Constable Precinct 4. Uh, I've been in law enforcement for 28 years. Uh, I recently, in December of 2020, uh, retired as a Lieutenant Shift Commander at Harris County Constable Precinct 3. Uh, one of the things that got me interested in law enforcement, believe it or not, growing up in a small town, I really had never seen a police officer, a black police officer until 1984 when I was down at the Houston Police Department playing basketball. And that was really the first time I had ever seen a black police officer. And I walked up to one of the guys and I said, hey, man, how can I be a police officer like you? And at the time, I was about 22 years old. And that kind of got me into law enforcement. Uh, I have a associate degree in law enforcement. I have a Bachelor of Science in Administration of Criminal Justice. And I have a master's degree and uh, Homeland Security with a minor in forensic psychology. Mm, okay, I learned something new. That's a shame, I didn't even know that. <laughs> so basically he's been a police officer as long as I've been born. Okay, cause I'm 28. So <laughs> he's been a police wow. officer my whole life. That's that's all I've ever known. Even even pulled over my mama one time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember that. You pulled over my mama for speeding. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the first African American chief deputy. Correct. I saw in one of your other interviews. Yes, I'm the first uh, African American chief deputy in Fort Bend County Precinct Four which kind of covers the, the Sugar Land area. Okay, we got to give a round of applause to Brad. Hey, African American Chief Deputy, I'm proud. So right. now I wanted to touch on your perspective when it comes to police brutality against minorities and against uh, our African American community to see, you know, how do you feel about it from being an African American male? Well, um, you know, it, it's kind of unique how this thing all started uh, when I became a police officer in 1991. It was actually, I kind of uh, 
reinforce what I had talked previously talked about uh, right after the doing the Rodney King trial in 1991. That was in March of 1991. And I remember making a statement at the time, if, if I was a police officer and I was out on that scene, I would not let that happen to not only a, uh, a uh, black person, but any other person. And uh, believe it or not, in August of 1991 is when I started the police academy. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I spoke on that too in one of my previous videos about the LA riots in 1992, because, you know, that was one of, that was one in is that a man? Listen. <laughs> Look, uh -uh, I'm rebuking. Um, so yeah, I did touch on that because that was a very pivotal moment for me. Um, you know, that was recorded. The LA 92 riots was a, a very big part of our history. And, you know, at the time, now we have all these cell phones and all this video footage. But, you know, back in 92, that was a limited thing. Like, you know, I was watching a documentary where they were saying, one of the young ladies was saying, you know, back then we didn't have camera phones and we didn't have these cell phones to be able to record this footage of police brutality. So um, it's, in, it's important and it's evolved as time goes by that we are able to capture these moments. And, you know, sometimes it, it, it hurts to be able to see that on camera. And sometimes yeah. we have to step away from it because it can be overwhelming. And a lot of people have kind of made it seem like this is a new thing. And it's not. It's something that's been happening to our people for a while now. It's just that now we have social media and we have these, this technology to actually bring it to the forefront. And then now we have like the Black Lives Matter movement. We have more people that are protesting, more people that are speaking out on these things. So it's amazing how we've come to this point and how we've grown to attack police brutality against minorities. And, you know, with the, I've been watching the Derek Chauvin trial. I've been like really watching it because, you know, I want to learn more about it. And we actually talked about this. We're able to learn so much from it. And I'm, I'm anxious to see what comes of this and the changes that are going to come from it. Do you think that there's going to be a change or, you know, do you think that's like a first step of change for us? Should he be prosecuted and sentenced um, for the killing of George Floyd? Yeah, I, I believe that there's going to be change. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of change, a matter of fact, uh, right after uh, that uh, Derek Chauvin incident, uh, there was policies and procedures that was put out immediately that uh, made it reinforce a duty to intercede. And that doesn't mean just standing there saying, you know, hey, don't do that, do that. Uh, now we do require uh, police officers who observe uh, other officers violating people's rights, regardless if they're black or white, that they have to take meaningful action, physical action if needed to stop the, the uh, transgression. Uh, but I think it'll take a while. I think it'll take a while. I don't think it's anything that'll happen overnight. Uh, I think uh, 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 black officers for a long time, you know, we uh, got it from both sides. Uh, we actually had to, you know, take it from other black people that thought we were sellouts, thought that we were on Katons, and then we had to also uh, get it from uh, the opposite race. You know, it, whether it be Hispanic or white or any other race. Yeah, and that, that was actually going into my next question on what it's like to be an African-American male as well as a police officer because you're on both sides. And like you said, a lot of uh, the African-American police officers take a lot of heat for the police brutality and things that are going on with our minorities. So, you know, we see it on, on TVs and television shows, but that's, I don't feel like that's an accurate display of it. So right. I wanted to know, like, what is it like being both and being on both sides? Is there a divide within, because, you know, you're, you're blue, you wear blue and you are black. So is there like a division sometimes or, you know, how, do, how, does, how is that for you? Yeah, you know, I can actually speak on, on both sides. You know, even in this family, uh, I have a lot of friends that are police officers and I had other friends 
uh, that have gotten into it with family members uh, about being a police officer. Uh, fortunately, you know, I've never had that to happen to my family. Uh, uh, they, you know, it appears that all my family members love me and they never ostracized me because I'm a police officer. But yes, being a, uh, a, a African-American police officer in America is tough. Uh, I have faced uh, situations where I felt like uh, I may have been punished a little bit more harshly because I was African American and then someone else, uh, a white or Hispanic person, uh, commit something either the same or higher uh, policy violation, they get less punishment. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's not a perception, you know, I've actually filed the EEOC complaint and, and take it out, take it all the way to, to nearly court because of it. It wasn't just a perception, but yes, in some situations we are treated differently and we are punished more harshly, uh, you know, even after you get in law enforcement. And also, you know, when I first started applying, trying to get in law enforcement, there were systemic barriers that prevented African-Americans uh, from actually becoming police officers. Really? Hmm. Yeah. I I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised at all. And as chief deputy, you're actually, you know, at a high ranking. So you're over, you know, as I was watching the Derek Chauvin trial and they brought in like the police chief and other officers. So with your ranking, you have officers under you as well that you have to account for. Is that, an, is that accurate? Yes. Uh, matter of fact, uh, my previous agency when I was at Harris County uh, actually was the use of force compliance person. So anytime deputies uh, that were involved in a use of force, Mm -hmm. then uh, it would come to me and I would also review the video footage, the reports, witness statements. And, and if I uh, uh, saw or observed any policy violations, then I would take the appropriate action. Uh, and I saw uh, one year, I think maybe 2018, we had a real high number of use of force. And in the next year after that, those use of force cut in half because they know that not only myself, but the agency wasn't going to stand for anybody using excessive use of force or unnecessary force. Okay. I didn't know that. That is, that's phenomenal. I'm glad that we have someone like you. I know you as my uncle, so I know that you care for the people, you care for the community, you care for me because every time I get in trouble, <laughs> every time, like literally I've called my uncle at two in the morning because I'm about to do something crazy because <laughs> one thing about Evans women and y'all already know on this channel, whoo, talk about a handful. So I'm like, Uncle Jimmy, this, this, this. <laughs> So you have personally gotten me through a lot and I'm spoiled. I'm the baby. So, yes. you know, my father did have 10 kids, but I'm the baby. I'm the spoiled one. So I am definitely quick to call my uncle Jimmy and like, no, I'm calling my uncle. He's a police officer. <laughs> oh yeah. So I definitely, you know, I am very appreciative that you are in our community and you are out there helping and you are, yes. you know, trying to make the police force and the police in general a better and safer place because we are supposed to look to law enforcement and police officers to keep us safe and yes. unfortunately you know black people we don't feel comfortable because you know even if we call the police we're not guaranteed to get an african-american officer and yes. you know i don't i don't know about the statistics so as far as statistics go you know, what is the, the statistics with African-American officers and white officers in, in today's world? Like, well, you know, what I've experienced, I've uh, had the opportunity to uh, work in predominantly black neighborhoods, you know, uh, throughout Harris County, the city of Houston. And sometimes it's difficult. And a lot of police officers, believe it or not, uh, when they're in the academy, uh, when they start asking you where you, what district or what area you want to work, a lot of African-Americans choose not to go and work in the African-American com community because they feel like they would have to work twice as hard to convince them that, hey, we are here for you. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's something. Uh, but there is a push now to try to uh, push African-Americans to patrol African-American neighborhoods because people, they feel like if the officer looked like you, you may have a lot more trust 
in that person than someone who does not look like you. Yeah, that is definitely very accurate. And I know uh, you said you're you're moving to or you're in Fort Bend County now in the Sugarland area. And, you know, from from my perspective, I feel like that may be a predominantly white area. So, you know, is it, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, I live in the hood. So, so you know, it's for being, like, how has that change and that transition for you coming from Harris County to Fort Bend County as far as, like, demographics go and the, the race that are different between certain neighborhoods and moving to Fort Bend County? Yeah, you know, um, uh, Sugar Land is, and Fort Bend County is, is you know, uh, according to statistics, is one of the most diverse community in the nation. Uh, and also uh, in the three months that I've been in Fort Bend County, I, I do notice that, but I also notice a little, uh, a little difference in the demographics and the way people may look at you in a certain way. Uh, so it, there's an adjustment. And uh, our department, we have about 40 uh, law enforcement certified peace officers. And that's one thing that we do is make sure that our agency is dirt, uh, diversified and it, it looks like the community in which we uh, uh, patrol. Okay. And also, as I know, my cousin, uh, Little Jimmy, as we call him, uh, your son yes. is also a police officer. Is he still in Fort Bend County as well? Yes, yes. He's still in Missouri City. Okay. Yeah, he's still there. Yeah, we come from a family of actually uh, law enforcement. Like, you know, most of my family has worked in law enforcement, worked for TDC, even my dad at one point. <laughs> like, I still have the picture. If I can find the picture, I'm going to put it up in a video of him in his gray uniform <laughs> coming to yes. my grandmother's house. Yes. And so, you know, we do yep. come from a family of, we're from Madisonville in the Huntsville area. So, you know, a lot of my family does come from the justice system and from that background. So can yeah. you give us um, any words of wisdom or advice as minorities and as African-Americans on, you know, what do we do at this time or how do we, how can we react or interact with police officers to kind of create this comfortability to be able to, you know, be safe calling police officers because right now we don't feel safe doing it. So are there any like words of wisdom you can give us or any type of motivation, any type of advice that you can give us as African-Americans? Yes, you know, I just like to, for everybody to know that all police officers aren't bad, but I always tell people that if you feel like you was wrong by a police officer, if you're on a traffic stop or you have to call the police for any reason, and if you feel like that police officer is violating your right, just go ahead and comply. Comply and also ask for a supervisor uh, because uh, it doesn't do you any good to try to fight the situation. And you may be right, and then you end up still getting arrested. So just comply, ask for a supervisor. And that in most agencies, and I would probably say all agencies, if you request a supervisor, then that supervisor, is it's mandatory that he make that scene. Just comply and uh, treat us, you know, just just give us the benefit of the doubt. And if you happen to have a bad encounter with a police officer, I know some of my law enforcement friends may kind of frown on it. But if you feel like you was wrong, file a form of complaint. Call a supervisor, go in and file a complaint. Uh, myself, I sit in the office seven and a half hours a day. And the only way I know one of the reasons I know what's going on out there is for the public to report any uh, bad behavior or misbehavior by officers that they reserve, uh, I mean, they observe, because if they don't tell us, we don't know about it. And that person will just grow, grow, and it'll get bigger and bigger. So I, I really encourage the public, if you see an officer do something to you or anybody else, report it, report it, report it, report it. Okay. And one last question I have, uh, you know, as we're watching the George Floyd video in the situation, me and some of my friends and my coworkers have talked about, you know, the bystanders. And, you know, we kind of like the, uh, <clears throat> the fire, the EM, EMS who wanted to, you know, check his pulse or the guy who was trained in MMA who was, you know, wanted to 
go out and check on him and had to be pulled back. So, you know, what is, what do you think the best way for us as bystanders who have to watch that or may have to watch that? Like, is there anything that we can do or is there like a proactive thing we can do? Because, you know, it's hard to, to watch that happen. And, you know, me and my coworker made a joke, like, Hey, you know, if it was us, we, we probably like 10, you know, we had to rush them. Like, I don't, I don't know that I would be able to sit there and watch that happen, knowing that even putting my life in danger, um, I don't know if I would be able to sit there and watch that. So, you know, I know it's risky. I know you're probably going to tell me, Miranda, don't do that. But, you know, is there anything else that we can do? Should we witness this, you know, or, you know, getting badge numbers or any, just anything? Or is there anything we can do as bystanders to try at least help the situation, you know, even yep. if it's not a George Floyd situation, just a general uh, situation in general. And I can actually tell you, um, you know, a couple days ago, there were six officers outside of my apartment in full gear. And, you know, they were on the intercom asking the suspect to come out with his hands up. Now, at the time, I didn't know it was my neighbor. So, you know, me, I pulled out my phone to record it because I'm like, look, if something go down, <laughs> I'm recording y'all. Right. So, right. you know, but, I, but gratefully they were able to handle the situation in a positive way. There was no aggression. There was no fighting, no anything like that. So he came out with his hands up, he complied. So, you know, luckily we have, I've seen and witnessed that situation recently on, you know, everything going the proper way. So, you know, is there anything we can do as bystanders, you know, that we can help the situation? Well, you know, law enforcement now, you know, we're better trained in dealing with people that are recording. Uh, I would uh, suggest just, you know, stay at a safe distance because whenever we we involved in the use of force or an encounter, the, some, we don't know what the crowd is going to do. It can immediately turn on you and then you end up getting the interference with police officer's duty. So I would just say, stay back at a safe distance, you know, video, uh, stay there and be a good witness, be a good witness. I wouldn't encourage anybody, you know, probably to attack the officer, but be a good witness. <laughs> I'm bad, y'all. Like, <laughs> he knows me. I'm, it's, it's hard for me. I don't, you know, I don't know that I would have tried to attack, but it, it, it was a struggle because a lot of people were saying like, you know, why didn't they do more and they should have done this and they should have done that. But you got to understand in that situation, in that specific situation, it was yeah. already an aggressive situation. So, yeah. you know, and luckily we do have, you know, with the situation with Philando Castile, we do have the ability to be able to record these things. And we, but the, the part comes in that we just want to see justice served. You know, yeah. we just want to see these officers held accountable for their actions because now this is my personal opinion. Had this been an African-American officer, I feel like they would have been quicker to prosecute or quicker to do something about it versus a white officer. Now I could be wrong on that, but that's just how I feel personally. Um, yes. You know, and I don't know if you want to agree with that, but, <laughs> but me personally, that's how, you know, I would feel about it. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and there's some, I probably would have to agree with you uh, on that, you know, uh, you know, depending on the uh, the facts of the case, but mm -hmm. also now that we really push hard for officers to intercede. You know, uh, back in the day, just like those officers just standing around, now the, the officers understand that they have to do something that is meaningful. If they have to run over there and push them off of that person, they better do it because if not, there's going to be severe consequences for them also. Yeah, and I noticed that with the with the show and trial and the George Floyd situation, because, you know, there were a couple officers like Officer Lane that was like, you know, can we we should turn on his side. And I think he's right. he think he's passing out. And I guess Chauvin being the superior officer was like, no, you know, he's OK. So you did have the attempt. You know, he, he was wrong for participating in that, but at least there was an attempt to say, hey, you know, this we need to turn him over. We need to put him on side recovery, things like that. I plan on doing a video, touching on the trial a little bit. 
But you know, we I, I did notice that. I did I do have to point that part of it out. Do I feel like they should have faced charges? Yes, I do. But you know, unfortunately, we are still working on the justice system and we're still trying to repair. Like you said, it's gonna take time. It's gonna yeah. take time. And we have to start from within. So that's why I'm grateful that we do have African American officers and we have to know that it's a battle on each on on both of sides because you're an officer, but you're also an African American male. So, yes. you know, you do have that kind of division and that kind of separation in certain cases. So yes. thank you. And okay. is there anything else you want to add? No, uh, just let you know that I'm proud of you. You keep up the good work. And anytime you need me to come on or give me a call or, or even if you get in trouble, you know what to do. I was you know gonna say, number. you know I'm gonna call you. <laughs> I will call you if I get in any trouble. I definitely, you're going to be the first person I call. I'm like, All look, right. uh, I'm going to need you to call Chief Deputy, uh, Deputy Chief Jimmy Evans. He is my uncle and he works for Fort Bend and I want him on the phone right now. I am not. <laughs> I know you will do it. You, you will do it. That's the honest I'm truth. dropping names. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. Oh, Lord. Well, thank you so much, Uncle Jimmy, for giving me the, the insight and the light and giving my viewers that conversation. And, you know, hopefully I, pr I pray that everybody takes something from this. Um, yes. I really wanted to do this. I've been wanting to do it. And we are in the We Matter series, and this is part four. I do have one more part of it coming. So, you know, and I'm still... I'm still deciding if I want that to be the Derek Chauvin trial, but I'm, I want to continue this series because I feel like it's an important topic and it's an important thing that we need to talk about as African Americans. And you know, my voice is really loud. And when yeah. I get passionate about something, I'm definitely going to talk about it. So <laughs> I right. want to thank you so much, uncle, um, for coming on and yeah. I love you very much. And please stay safe. I worry about you so much. I so, sure will. Promise me you're going to stay safe. I'm going to stay safe. I promise. Okay. I love right. you and thank you very much. All right. Anytime. Okay, everybody. That was Deputy Chief Jimmy Evans, my uncle. And I would like to thank him for coming on the Motivation With Me YouTube channel. And I want to thank y'all for tuning in. Make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe, all of that get into it we have so many more videos coming i don't know what the topic for the next video is gonna be but i guess we will find out so that was episode 20 of motivation with me